nuclear has a, a portion of the, the dynamic mix that would make up our ability to, to rely upon renewable energies. It would make sense, you know, France has over 50 nuclear power plants. They're a net exporter of, of energy. They rely upon nuclear energy. There's no reason why in less populated areas in upstate New York, we wouldn't be able to build other nuclear power plants. Um, but to, to, you know, the suggestion that we can close down Indian Point tomorrow, it's not economically feasible. Mm -hmm. our, our energy rates would go through the roof. It's not feasible from a jobs perspective. We're already hemorrhaging jobs in the Hudson Valley. We'd lose over 1,000 jobs uh, over, overnight. And what would you want to replace that nuclear power plant with? Coal, which is much dirtier, uh, or, or other plants that, that are a lot dirtier. So, you know, we've, I get the national security perspective. Mm -hmm. Let's make it a priority. Make sure that, that uh, Indian Point is protected. Um, if you actually want to replace Indian Point at some point, uh, what a great job creation program to build more nuclear power plants to the north where it's much less populated. But do you think people would be for that? Or do you think it's something... Like you know, if we're going to have a serious discussion about renewable energy and how to provide cheap energy uh, that's environmentally sensible, nuclear has to be a portion mm -hmm. uh, of that conversation. Uh, we have to look at geothermal. We have to look at wind. Um, we have to uh, look at all of the... Uh, all of the resources that we have available to us, but nuclear certainly has to be a portion of that. And I think people, though, are very afraid of that because of the risk that is the potential risk of, you know, something that could possibly happen, either terrorist or something that could happen at the nuclear plant itself. So people look at that and say, then we shouldn't have that because there is so much risk to it. But you have to weigh the pros and cons with it. If you take a country like France, I mean, France is not exactly a conservative regime, and they rely upon nuclear energy. And in the United States of America, the largest issue is the spent fuel. What do you do with that spent fuel? And I believe, and I could be wrong, but I believe it was by presidential directive in the Carter administration that we don't allow uh, the producers to reuse the spent, the spent fuel. And if we did allow the producers, as they do in other countries, to reuse that fuel, that would solve 99% of the problem. Because if you, even at Indian Point, one of the biggest issues is not the dome, which is you know, built mm -hmm. to withstand an enormous attack, including a, a, a jetliner, but the spent fuel pools that are outside the facility. Mm -hmm. And that is the largest issue with any nuclear plant. So I think we really got to rethink our position on that allow the producers to reuse their, their spent fuel. Um, but nuclear energy as a larger component in less populated areas could be a huge job creator and a big part of getting us off of our addiction to foreign oil, which is not only a issue of financial concern, but of national security concern. We are filling the pockets of people who want to kill us, mm -hmm. and that's a problem. And I think the nuclear option is a better problem, is a better, excuse me, is a better alternative to what you just said, to funding those people who technically basically At want to. At least in the component, because a lot of these other green technologies that we speak of, which we should be talking about. Like what other about, green technologies? It, Could you talk about, potentially you talk about, we use around about solar, here. If you talk about wind, you talk about geothermal, um, many of these technologies, because of the price point, are so expensive that it's, it's, not worth it's cost it. prohibitive at this point to employ those technologies on a, whole, on a large scale. Mm -hmm. And that's why when you talk about green solutions, you have to include nuclear, you have to include wind, you have to include geothermal, you have to include solar, you have to include the entire gamut in order to have kind of like a cocktail of options that work together to get us off our addiction to foreign oil. Oil is cheap and it is also fueling our enemies. And it's within our national security interest to stop feeding uh, the people who wish to harm us. Exactly. Our national security interest would not be to shut down Indian Point because it is a potential terrorist target. And if the federal government, if, if, if it's decided that it's within our strategic national interest or it really is a security concern, then the federal government should make it their priority, working with, in a public-private partnership, to build another nuclear power plant to the north in a much less populated mm -hmm. area. Hillary Clinton went around saying she was going to create, I don't know, 30 million, you know, <laughs> like 200,000 new jobs in upstate New York. 
nuclear could be a great uh, component. It could be a great uh, alternative. Sense. But you don't shut down, you know, to say that we're going to replace it with windmills or to say that we're going to replace it with it's gas astronomical. is, is it's not true. And it, it's, a, it's foolish. Talk about another alternative, natural gas, hydrofracking. Explain that. Well, right now, we, you know, we have uh, hydrofracking. And uh, honestly, when I heard that word, I thought it was misspelled, and I had no clue what it was. What so it was. I did my own research. Yeah. And now I, it, I mean, you can explain it a lot better than Well, I, no, I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> great thing about it, being a politician is that you're a, a jack of all trades and a master of none, <laughs> so, um, or a few. There's a large region called the Marcellus Shell, mm -hmm. where there are large natural gas deposits um, in New York State. Mm -hmm. And there has been a real push in New York State, including by our Democratic governor, to push hydrofracking, which is a process where um, individuals actually uh, force a liquid into the ground to reach the natural gas, and then they're able to take the natural gas out of, out of the out of the earth, thousands and thousands of feet. And in other states like Colorado and like Texas, uh, even in Pennsylvania, there have been some nightmare experiences where the water that they're forcing into the earth also has an industrial waste inside of mm -hmm. it, industrial waste component. And there has been pollution, some say a lot, and some say a little bit. But when you, you know, in New York State, it's been my perspective that we don't have the opportunity, especially if you look at where this is going to be, whether it be New York City drinking water or local drinking water, we've got to make sure that we get it right. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to, I want to look to other states that have learned that there are some serious consequences to, to hydrofracking. Make sure that we get it right. Because while we may create a few hundred jobs or a few thousand jobs from this process, no doubt, it's not worth it if we contaminate our drinking water for 6,000 years or beyond. So the key is to make sure we get the process right, Absolutely, I want to create jobs, but I'd like to see a moratorium until we can work as a community and as a state to make sure that we're not going to damage our drinking water. Even if the amount of natural gas that could be could come from the upstate New York Marcellus Shale, um, it would last the country. It would, it would serve the country 15 years of natural gas. That's well, not. I mean, you never know according to the estimates, but I hope that to be the case. But uh, if we're going to have a plentiful supply of natural gas for 15 mm -hmm. years, but we can't drink our water for 6,000, then it's a little bit of an issue. So we've got to make sure that, that the process that we use is clean, that there is as close to zero percentage of mm -hmm. harming our drinking water supply as possible, and, and then move forward. This is new technology that they're using, is it not? They are using new technologies, but our, there are, let's put it this way, there are new technologies mm -hmm. afforded to the industry that would allow them to tap into those natural gas supplies conceivably without contaminating our drinking water. But our statutes in the state and our laws in the state and our regulations do not require them to use those new technologies. So that's why we've got to get our laws up to speed before we release any moratorium on the process. Mm -hmm. So with the new technologies, we need updated laws and regulations that will go along with them. To make sure they're uh, used, utilized properly. Exactly. So even though it is a big, we could pull away from using, you know, and it's an alternative to using foreign oil the natural gas we could gain could from New component. York State. Absolutely, yep. And it would create a lot of jobs in the process. It definitely could. Yep. So, let's talk about your opponent. Okay. Speaking of natural gas. You want to speak about no, that? No. Okay. <laughs> so, there's five pledges that your opponent has now signed on to. What are they? You want me to tell you? I, I would like to. I, yeah. All I, don't, right. I don't read his press releases. I have other stuff to do. You have not? I have not. All right. A little, well, busy, little busy. It seems like, well, I read what his platforms, you know, what he stands for, and very, very similar to your views right. and what you stand for. Where do you guys differ? Well, I mean, you got to look at any politician can stand in front of a camera and say, I'm for reform. Of course. And some of them can do it really consistently. And then when you, you know, get... I mean, I, I'm, the guy, who's, I'm the guy who stood on, exactly, and it's actually, you know, I tell people, if you sat in my chair in the New York State Assembly, you'd puke, because all these assemblymen and many of the senators, they tell you, I'm fighting for you, I'm fighting for you, and then they go up to Albany, and they drink the Kool-Aid in the, the members-only lounge, and it's a club. So then how are you going to be well, different? I mean, I've done it. 
I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm combat tested. You know, I've, I've got, I've got uh, the medals to prove it. I have the battle scars. I have more scar tissue on my back than you know most World War II vets. I mean, the, the reality is, is that I have been in political combat. My first speech on the floor of the New York State Legislature was to stand up and say, this is the nation's most dysfunctional legislature. And that wasn't a one-time speech. I didn't do that and issue a press release. Now, I did that because it was the right thing to do. And I have stood up every single day to the most powerful people in the state. I was the only Republican, in, forget about Democrat, Republican, I was the only Republican in the state to stand up and ask Joe Bruno to step down two years before that Crooks indictment. I am the guy that my own party has spent $2 million to take me out for a job that pays $79,000 a year. And you spend $40,000 a year on chicken dinners. <laughs> you know, so there's a real net negative going on here. But, you know, at the end of the day, we have, and I call him Tax Hike Mike, uh, you know, he, he's a funny guy when he stands up in front of people. But at the end of the day, his constituents are crying all the way to the, to the, to the poorhouse. Because this is somebody, when given the opportunity, you've got to look. Do not believe what politicians tell you when you're talking to them. You oh. have to go online. and You have to do, you your, have to research, do your own research. And you have to look at their voting record. Just this like is somebody else. who voted for the federal affordable housing debacle. This is somebody who voted to increase property taxes in Putnam County. This is some, in, in Westchester County. This is somebody who voted to increase income taxes and sales taxes. This is somebody who actually... Um, work to give Boss Ryan uh, pay increases and salary stipend increases. This is somebody who's part of the dysfunction of White Plains. And White Plains is a place under the regime of Andrew Spano that almost made Albany look kind of, you know, kind of normal if you compare the two. Um, so to think that, I, that now during an election that my opponent says he's for reform, you know what, Mike, we needed you in White Plains fighting for reform. We needed you not voting for salary hikes and pay hikes and um, stipend hikes for boss Ryan, who was the chairman of the legislature, we needed you fighting against it. You know, every time Andy Spano needed tax hike Mike, tax hike Mike was there. Every time Andy Spano had a tax increase, he relied upon his, his budget chairman, tax hike Mike. When Andy Spano needed the federal affordable housing uh, settlement, which is gonna cost taxpayers $60 million, when he needed uh, that rubber stamped, he called up tax hike Mike. And now tax hike Mike will stand in front of a camera in any podium and any microphone he can find telling me he's going to reform Albany. And at the end of the day, what I love is that I am not handpicked by the Albany. Albany's worst nightmare uh, is me arriving in that chamber and challenging the status quo. The hand of Albany came down and said, tax hike Mike, we need you. And when the hand of Albany comes down to pick a candidate, they don't pick you for your independence or because you're going to shake up Albany. They pick you because they know that you're going to be a team player on the, uh, the team that is Albany Incorporated and maintain the status quo. So he can do whatever he wants in front of the cameras and talking to reporters. Don't trust what he says. Look at the track record. And I would say the same thing for May. Please, look at my track record. I think that says it all. Thank you very Thank much. You. We're out of time. And I think we covered a lot of good issues and great points. Went fast. So it, it went very fast, didn't it? Thank you for watching 30 Minutes with Elizabeth DeFaber. See you.